Life Audio. And part of what the preacher is urging all of us to do is to allow seasons to come and to trust that we have a good God who is sovereign, who knows what will endure, who knows what works and what's happening in your life, that you can trust him and that we have to come to settled acceptance that there are things that God understands and that God sees and knows that we ourselves will never understand. And part of trusting God and part of a right understanding, a humble understanding of who you are, is knowing that to be the case. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Hey everyone, I'm Nicole Eunice, your host of How to Study the Bible, and we are in a series in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I just read to you from the beginning of chapter 3, which we're going to be looking at together today. Hopefully you are joining us. You've heard last week's as we sort of kicked off this introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're studying Ecclesiastes because you guys, this community, has asked for this study. We have a Facebook community that you can join and we'll drop it in the show notes for you if you want to be connected and ask questions and be engaged with the work that we're doing together. But Ecclesiastes is a very interesting book. And like we talked about last week, it's really designed to provoke emotion and get us thinking. And what we heard last week was all about how the preacher, who is the writer of Ecclesiastes, probably King Solomon, wrote this idea of sending out these words to the assembly, meaning like a group of people gather together. And really, Ecclesiastes is about what does a good life look like? And how do we make sense of a good God in the midst of a broken and dark world? And so we hear the musings of the teacher as he considers what does it look like to number our days correctly, which we're going to talk about today. So today's episode is called Planning Life in Light of Eternity. And we're going to be looking at that together in Ecclesiastes 3 in two parts. Traveling to the Holy Land will be one of the most amazing trips of your life. Walking the same steps that Jesus did is an overwhelming and powerful experience that you will never forget. It's time to go visit the birthplace of the Bible. For more information, go to holyland.israel.travel. Israel, exactly like nowhere else. Christians should be serious about our faith. But does that mean we need to be serious people all the time, especially in a world of weird, absurd stuff, and even when Christian culture gets crazy? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Rant Podcast, where we cheerfully rant about pop culture, church culture, work, creativity, life, and just about everything. But we take Jesus seriously. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com. So I'm going to read you the first part. I want to invite you to just listen to these words and listen for what stands out for you. You know, as we study the Bible together, one of the important things that we can do is listen for tone and emotion, as well as sort of the words used and the structure, sometimes, especially when we're looking at wisdom literature, which is what Ecclesiastes is considered. We want to think about the poetic aspects of what's being said here. This isn't meant to be taken literally. This isn't like an encyclopedia. This isn't an instruction manual for your washer and dryer. This is beautiful literary work. And let's enter into it as such. Ecclesiastes 3. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. 
Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 through 8. Now, if you have been around this earth for a little while, you might think to yourself, this sounds strangely familiar. Where have I heard this before? Well, where you've heard it before is in the hit single from 1965 by the birds called Turn, Turn, Turn. It sort of became the anthem of a decade, a time in American history of civil rights and the Vietnam protests and cultural change. And the birds took these words from Ecclesiastes, added just a few other words to it, really, the last line, a time for peace. I know it's not too late. That's the end of the song. But other than that, it's literally just this passage from Ecclesiastes. And what an interesting sort of juxtaposition to think about the fact that this is wisdom literature written thousands of years ago, kind of embracing this idea of how do we understand our humanity in light of eternity? How do we understand time? How do we rightly number our days for the world that we're in and the life that we've been given? Just as relevant several thousand years ago, as obviously it was relevant to 1965, as obviously it is relevant to today. There's a reason why that song is a classic and it's timeless because the preacher in Ecclesiastes has captured the human heart. It's captured a question of the human heart, which is how do we do life? How do I do life well? And what I love particularly about this first half of the passage is We're really invited in, right, not to necessarily parse out each and every word, although we could. I mean, we can we could break down this poem and parse out every single phrase. But I think what I want us to do is come up above it and really hear it and feel it. And as I read it out loud to you, I just I felt this deep sense of almost nostalgia and longing, like this understanding. Oh, my goodness, like our time is short. And life is full of ups and downs and life is full of mountains and valleys. And there's going to be time for really hard work and there's going to be time to rest. And there's going to be time where things in life might feel like they're falling apart. And there's going to be times where things in life feel like they're coming together. And that's actually part of the human existence. That's not something that you have to fear. It's not something that you have to dread. Like, what would it look like to open your hands and open your heart and say, I want to just live fully in the day that I have. Um, What you may notice um, when we think about this passage is that each of these phrases has an opposing thought that's connected to it. So all the way through these eight verses, we have sort of the thought of mourning and dancing, the thought of planting and uprooting, the thought of keeping and throwing away. So kind of these different aspects of life that there's, there's times in life where things are being broken down and there's times in life where things are being built up. Now, I would invite you and ask you to think about your life and your your culture, your your little world. Is there room in your world for not just building up, but also tearing down? Is there room in your world for not just working, but also resting? Is there room in your world for there to be times of mourning and grief in addition to joy and celebration? Because if we only do one half of these pairs of, of life, I think what we end up with is a very uneven life and we have emotion, usually painful emotions of grief and of loss and maybe of confusion or times of sadness. And we don't know what to do with them. And we think, is this a sin that I feel this way? Is it is it a sin that I'm not in a season where I'm like, you know, creating all of this stuff or doing all of these things? And a lot of what I see in the world that I'm in, you know, and the people that I'm around is that they end up exhausted and burnt out. And then they have to struggle with coming into a really dark place where their body's breaking down, their heart's breaking down in the sense of just losing their hope and losing their flourishing because there hasn't been pacing. There hasn't been room in life to say, oh, there is a time for everything. And there's going to be a time where I might have a winter season in my soul where it's a it's a quieter time or it's a time where I'm not producing a lot or I'm not leading a lot. And there's going to be times of fruitfulness as well, that there's both sides of the, that time. And I think where wisdom comes in, the reason this is wisdom literature and the real wisdom of this is it invites us to look at these pairs and say, do I make time for all of these things? And and what time am I in right now in my life? Like, 
what season am, am I in and what would it look like to have a lot of care for myself and compassion for myself in the season that I'm in? Not only that, but because God has called us to love others, I think that praying to understand rightly the season that someone else is in can be incredibly helpful. You know, we have times where maybe relationships in our life, families and friends, people may be a great support to us and then we may feel like they're not as supportive or people may be very available to us and then not as available. What would it look like to actually ask God to give you discernment to understand the season that they might be in? How might you love someone well? who is in a season where there is a lot of uprooting in their life, or they're in a time of healing, or they're in a time of weeping or mourning. And are you open to not trying to fix it, not trying to ignore it, not trying to get past it or to be upset at someone because they they aren't, you know, who they used to be for you, but you're actually lifting them up to the Lord and allowing them to have seasons like that, giving grace and compassion for seasons like that. So I think the invitation for sure in this first part of our night or our day today, I think the invitation for sure in this first section is really inviting reflection, inviting us to reflect with God on what time am I in? And also maybe for the people that you love, the people that you care for, what time are they in? And how might you support the time that they're in to have a right relationship with seasons of life, to have a right relationship with both joy and sorrow? is one of the ways that we grow in wisdom. Okay, let's go on in this chapter and read the next portion because, of course, this beautiful poem is contextualized. It's between two other thoughts, right? And the thought that we had from last week was this concept of, you know, meaningless. All is meaningless. Like if you're you're gonna strive after great things, it's it's not gonna come to anything. If you're gonna be self-indulgent, that's gonna run out too. So what we've heard in the first half, you know, first couple chapters of Ecclesiastes is, There's a life here where if you make these things, even good things, if you make them the thing that you think you're going to find life in, it's not going to work, right? And then we have this poem, and then we get the next portion. So let's read on and see what happens next in our passage. Verse 9, Ecclesiastes 3. Traveling to the Holy Land will be one of the most amazing trips of your life. Walking the same steps that Jesus did is an overwhelming and powerful experience that you will never forget. It's time to go visit the birthplace of the Bible. For more information, go to holyland.israel.travel. Israel, exactly like nowhere else. En The Home Depot te ayudamos a que tu baño quede tal y como te gusta. Y con ahorros de hasta 40% en artículos para baños seleccionados, es un buen momento para hacerlo. Como el grifo Oswald de arco prolongado de Glacier Bay, con acabado mate en oro y elegante diseño, que le agrega un toque moderno a cualquier baño y nunca pasa de moda. Elige de entre una variedad de estilos para que tu baño quede tal y como te gusta. Obtén hasta 40% de descuento en artículos de baño seleccionados en The Home Depot. Haces más. Logras más. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that. That's verse 11. I know there's nothing better for man than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Whatever is has already been and what will be has been before and God will call the past to account. Okay, so we have this beginning, chapters one and two, where the preacher is going through this journey of discovering that if he tries to find life in pleasure, if he tries to find life in work, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't fulfill, right? Then we get this beautiful poem about understanding time. And then we move into this section where really you can kind of see this dichotomy between the way that a man, a person, a human being experiences the world and the way God experiences the world. And if you looked at verses 9 through 15 and you made a list, you would see that there's this difference, right, between human beings and God. And you see that for human beings, they're trying to figure out work, right? 
that God has laid work on people and that God has also put eternity in the hearts of men. And where does this come from? This comes all the way back from Genesis chapter one, two, and three. This is really the origin story of human beings. And if you remember what happens in the Garden of Eden, God makes human beings. He makes Adam and Eve. He calls it good. He gives them work. He sets them in a beautiful place to flourish. And he gives them one rule. And the only rule is that they cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They can eat from every other tree. So they're living in eternity. They're living in perfect communion with each other and with God. And then they are tempted, Eve is tempted, and then Adam to eat from that tree. And many people would say that the knowledge of good and evil is what human beings were not designed to be able to handle. But when we fell from grace, when we fell out of relationship with God through eating from that tree, we became knowledgeable about good and evil. We, we became, we had more knowledge than we could actually handle in our finite human being. And so we see this idea that we have eternity in our hearts. We were built for something more than this earth, but we then have to toil and figure out how to live in this world with knowledge of good and evil in a way that we can't fully comprehend. But yet we see in this passage, God is the one who can fully comprehend it. He's the one who understands what will endure forever. He's the one who knows what will make things good. He's the one who knows the beginning to the end. Like, God knows the whole story. He's outside of time. God is not just above time. He's outside of time. He's the creator of time, which means that he can see our whole life play out and he knows the whole thing before it even begins. There's there's almost no analogy that can really work for understanding this. And this one is is not a great one, but let's use it. To me, it's kind of like when you have a jigsaw puzzle and you're up above it and you see all the pieces and you know that it's kind of come together. And we're like one, we can only see one piece of it. <laughs> we, we see one piece at a time. Can you imagine trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, but you were only given one piece at a time and you were told where to put the piece in order in, in, in the right place and you had no, you didn't even have the box. You didn't even know what you were building or making. That's kind of what it feels like to be a human being. <laughs> you get these one piece at a time. And we're called to live rightly in time, but God is above and the creator of the puzzle. He knows how it's coming together. He knows where the pieces are going. He sees how it's going to all play out. So even if you're in a time of great suffering and you're in a time where you feel like you're in the valley of the shadow of death, God knows where that piece belongs. And part of what the preacher is urging all of us to do is to allow seasons to come and to trust that we have a good God who is sovereign, who knows what will endure, who knows what works and what's happening in your life, that you can trust him and that we have to come to settled acceptance that there are things that God understands and that God sees and knows that we ourselves will never understand. And part of trusting God and part of a right understanding, a humble understanding of who you are, is knowing that to be the case. Now, that may seem very simple to you. It might seem like, of course, I believe that. But the reality is, as human beings, we we constantly are moving towards living like we are the Lord of our own lives. So like we live like we're little gods who can shape our universe and we shape our little kingdom and we can control everything. And, and we want to control things. In fact, that's what the preacher was saying, right? In Ecclesiastes 1 and 2, he's like, hey, I made great things. I built great things. It didn't satisfy. I thought I could like build myself a little kingdom and it would be great. And it wasn't. And so really this understanding of a right, a right understanding of time and a right understanding of our place in time is incredibly freeing. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So I wrote down, what do I think this means? How would we rightly interpret this chapter of Ecclesiastes? And I wrote this, God who knows all and is beyond time is the one we can trust. Rightly numbering our days and seasons leads to the content and peaceful human life, right? That's what this is leading us to. In between all of this kind of questioning that we're going to hear from the preacher, we also have this idea from verse 12. I know there's nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. That's rightfully understanding our place in time and rightly understanding how we number our days. Planning life in light of eternity, friends. So if you're going to apply that today, I would invite you to say, what time are you in? 
and what would it look like to live rightly just today and trust the rest of your days to the Lord who loves you, who knows you, and who already sees how everything is playing out. Talk with you guys next week. How to Study the Bible with Nicole Eunice is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you like what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review the podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. This podcast is supported by Morgan Stanley. At Morgan Stanley, old school hard work meets bold new thinking to help you see untapped possibilities and relentlessly work with you to make them real. To learn more, visit morganstanley.com slash why us. Investing involves risk. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, LLC.